Good evening. Welcome to the City of Riverbank Regular City Council and Local Redevelopment Authority Board meetings. Today is Tuesday, September 25th, 2018. The time is 6 p.m. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. <laughs> Roll call, please. Council Authority Member Leanne Jones Cruz. Here. Council Authority Member Cal Campbell. Here. Council Authority Member District 2, Cindy Fossey. Here. Vice Mayor Chair Darlene Barbara Martinez. Here. Mayor Chair Richard O'Brien. Here. There will be no changes to the agenda. Any council, authority member, or staff who has a direct conflict of interest on any scheduled agenda item to be considered is to declare their conflict at this time. Seeing none, we'll start off with item 1.1, report on teen center activities. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, our Parks and Rec Director, Sue Fitzpatrick, is going to introduce the gentleman who's going to give the report tonight. I just wanted to add in that um, this is a proud moment for me because I've got the opportunity to work with Garrick a bunch. and. Um, he's done a lot for the city of Riverbank and does it mostly without any congratulations or accolade, um, but he's going to share a little bit about the teen center and all the neat things we're doing. And Sue can tell you a little bit more about his history here. Mayor, members of the council, um, Garrick Figueroa is going to come up and give a, a little um, kind of a, a clear shot of what they've been doing out at the teen center. We've been open now seven years and it flew by. So it's open, opened in 2011 and Garrick has been involved with the teen center since he was in the seventh grade or with the planning of the teen center. He actually helped design the teen center and uh, volunteered for the city for four years and has been an employee for 10 years. So he's been around quite a while kind of grown up with the city and has been a, had a nice impact on the the teen center itself so he's going to kind of get tell you what they've been up to and what kind of projects they're doing that they've been doing great and Garrick has been just an asset to that whole program um, good evening uh, so my name is Garrick Figueroa I am the teen center coordinator and I'm here tonight to give you guys a program update on the teen center So first, I'd like to let you know about the Riverbank Teen Action Committee. We have about 10 members who are active through each month they show up, and about 10 more who on occasion show up. Uh, the committee meets monthly to discuss fundraiser updates and ideas for youth activities and trips as well for the Teen Center. Over the summer, the group raised money during the movie in the park by selling popcorn, uh, which they did very well. They had a consistent line for the popcorn Unfortunately, that, that was a good thing and a bad thing because then some people kind of had to watch from the side. Um, they also participated in helping the rec staff with the sip and paint during the family fun night uh, in the park uh, during the summer. And the committee also participated in an end of summer overnighter at the teen center the week before school started. The Teen Center is open from 2.45 to 5.45 during the week, and we adjust our hours based on the high school and middle school schedule for if they have a minimum day or things like that. Uh, the average daily attendance is about 25 youth, um, with peak attendance at about 40, 32. Uh, we've had about 20 new sign-ups since school started back up at the beginning of August. Um, when we are open during the week for our drop-in hours, we have activities such as arts and crafts, video game tournaments, outdoor sports, pool, air hockey, tabletop games. Uh, we actually just started a new drum circle um, activity. We also open for special hours for a movie night and uh, Super Saturdays, which on a Saturday we'll either take a trip somewhere with the kids uh, or we'll open up the teen center. Uh, upcoming trips that we are planning on taking is a hiking trip around Pinecrest Lake this Saturday. Um, it's five dollars for if any youth hear about it. Um, and we go up, we hike around the lake, we might sit by the beach and let them play in the water if it's warm enough. Um, second, during October we plan on going to a corn maze. 
um, and have them kind of do some of that because we have a lot of students who don't get out of Riverbank much and um, and that's you know something we want to do with them this year um, in our during Christmas break we plan on taking them to Deloso Farms um, where we sometimes we do ice skating sometimes we go on their um, snow tubing hill that they have over there they always have a lot of fun during that as well um, uh, the events you can see here are programs that are great opportunities for volunteers that we have um, and also that they can take advantage of if they need help in certain areas. Um, for instance, we have Tutoring Tuesdays, which is going on right now, where we have rec staff and some volunteers, if we get them, help kids with tutoring. Um, we also have the teen drop-in hours where kids can come and volunteer, helping other kids if they need it. Um, we plan on having a cheese and mind booth this year where we'll, we're hoping to raffle off things to help raise money for the events. Uh, we have the Haunted Hayride where we're planning on putting up at least two sites of uh, the students um, to help scare the community. <laughs> um, we have the Christmas parade coming up uh, as well where we'll p most likely have a float to represent the teen center. And um, one of the new things we're doing is a winter donation drive for essentials where we plan on having the kids help collect blankets, backpacks, uh, hyg hyg hygiene essentials um, that we're going to put together and then when the weather starts getting colder we can pass that out and hopefully help our homeless community uh, stay a little warmer this year. Um, are there any, I don't know if I'm supposed to ask this, if there's questions or comments. Uh, a question, when you go to an event in the past, about how many uh, participants have you had? Um, it depends on the event. Our last um, Pine Creek trip, we had about nine kids go with us, and we took two vehicles. Um, and then some events, we've had up to 20 kids. Um, I think our overnighter, which we just stayed at the Teen Center for that, there was close to 20 kids during that. Well, I just want to say it's not a question, but I just want to say that uh, I think you're doing a fine job. I've heard nothing but positive comments, so keep up the good work, and thank you for being there. Thank you. Ahead of you. Um, I know it says teen center, but is there a minimum or maximum age? Uh, yeah, so we currently accept kids from age 9 to 19, um, and then so it's a few under teen. Okay. Sorry. 9 to 19? Yes. Uh, there's going to be a dental clinic uh, downtown Modesto at the, um, the plaza. Uh, in the dental, they usually have cases of toothbrushes. Would that be assistance for your hygiene that you're looking for the homeless? Yes, we're also hoping to get toothbrushes and toothpaste Okay, as well. I'll, I'll procure those for you. But I think you guys are doing a great job. And you're uh, the future leaders. And keep it up, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Item 1.2, 2018 Cheese and Wine Festival update. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Sue Fitzpatrick is going to introduce uh, our uh, coordinator for the event, who's going to give you an update on, on where we're at with wine and cheese it's coming up here. So we're in like the f home stretch at this point. Mayor, members of the Council, Cheese and Wine Festival is fast approaching. Um, this is the fifth year the city has um, overseen the event, contracting with Chris Ricky Presents. Um, 42nd year that the festival has been held in Riverbank. So Chris Ricky is going to come up and just kind of give you a brief update of how the planning is going and what to expect at the festival this year. Uh, thanks, Sue. Uh, Chris Ricky with Chris Ricky Presents. I'm excited to uh, help you guys produce the Cheese and Wine Festival again this year. Um, I think we had a short PowerPoint for you. Here we go. There's our new logo for this year. Want to get a little more color, so I think it looks pretty good. That's the only slide you have. <laughs> only one slide. <laughs> he said short. <laughs> that one? That one? That one? There we go. Sweet. There we go. 
All right. Uh, so obviously, an event like this, marketing is really important. Uh, for this year, we're making a lot of improvements in our social media area. Um, there's a lot of changes going on uh, in social media right now. Uh, some of the main changes is that we're going to be using multiple platforms. Last year, we did most of our social media marketing just on Facebook. Uh, this year, we're going to be also using Instagram uh, to market the event to kind of take advantage of the growth that Instagram's having. Uh, we're also going to be doing a lot more video ads. So we're going to be using video, using Instagram, using Facebook. And we're also um, doing a better job of managing our marketing budget on social media so that we get the most value for the money we're spending. Uh, we're also uh, going to continue the successful advertising we did with the Modesto B. Uh, last year, we did uh, a couple ads in the Modesto B. This year, we're going to do one ad on the front page of the Modesto B, and then we'll be following that up with a full page ad in the Modesto B in the A section uh, the day before the event. Uh, we also um, are going to be building on the successful relationship we have with our Hispanic radio partner. Uh, we gave them a slightly higher budget this year as a result of the great work they did last year, and we're excited to keep building that event, uh, the Hispanic area. Uh, it just did really well. Uh, we're also going to continue the relationship we have with Cumulus Media. That's Cat Country, uh, K-Win, The Hawk, and uh, K-Hop. Uh, vendor sales are going well. Uh, we currently have 55 vendors. Uh, most of the vendors come in the last two weeks prior to the event, so we're crossing our fingers that it goes as it has for the last five years. Uh, but it, things are looking pretty good there for our, for our vendor sales. I'm excited. Uh, our sponsorship sales, uh, we saw a nice bump this year from last year and the year before. Um, we're up to almost $17,000 in sponsors. I'd like to publicly welcome some of our new sponsors. Uh, that include Save Mart, uh, F&M Bank, and a local insurance company, uh, LHR Insurance, here based here in Riverbank. Um, we do, obviously, a wine tasting area. We partner with our friends over at, um, well, over here at the... Um, yeah, Antigua. There we go, Antigua Event Center. Uh, we've been doing it there for the last two years. It's been going well. Um, and we've refined the event every single year. Uh, and it just keeps getting better. Um, our sales are up almost 40% this year for ticket sales. And that's, that's really exciting. I take a lot of pride in that. Uh, but it's not just about tasting uh, beer and wine. It also, you can taste uh, Shabika olive oil in this area. You can taste some local mustards. We also have fondue to try now, uh, and we're going to have some local nuts for people to try in the wine tasting area this year. Uh, and also Save Mart is going to have some food items for people to try. So it's going to be not just about beer and wine. We're going to have lots of great food for people to try in the wine tasting area this year. Uh, one of the challenges we have with, with cheese and wine is that sometimes people say like, hey, you know, there's not enough cheese and wine out here on the street. So we're trying to address that a little bit this year. Um, and we're going to be creating an outdoor French-style wine cafe on the, uh, on the sidewalk on Santa Fe over between 3rd and 4th Streets. So you'll be able to sit in kind of a cafe-style seating and enjoy a glass of wine. We think it's going to be pretty spectacular. Um, we also are going to be adding a craft beer patio on 3rd Street so people can try some of the great local craft beers we have here in our community. We're also moving our... Uh, handmade craft area. Uh, last year it was kind of on the corner of Topeka and 3rd Street. This year we're moving that down uh, to 3rd Street between Santa Fe and Stanislaus Streets. And finally the last new addition we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing a live sip and paint. Uh, sip and paints are great. You know you get a basically you get a canvas, you get your paints, you get a painting instructor so you don't even know need to know how to paint. Uh, for ten dollars you can you know paint your own creation uh, and find out that, hey, like painting really isn't that hard. And for 10 bucks, it's a good way to spend a couple hours on a Saturday or Sunday. This is the uh, updated map. It looks like it's missing some lines. On, well, some stuff lost in the translation, but it'll give you an idea of where stuff is, uh, where we move the Maker's Fair, where the craft beer tasting is going to be, where the wine tasting, the wine cafe is going to be. The other um, big changes are we moved uh, one of the main stages up to 3rd and Topeka. 
to try to work with the uh, event flow. And we also are moving the Hispanic area kind of closer to 4th Street this year in Santa Fe to try to give them a little, little more room to, to grow this year. And that's my presentation. I think you're doing a great job, especially uh, with the increases in sales and marketing. Uh, fantastic. Uh, I know the final push, uh, you normally have a, um, um, a lot higher total, but if you compare um, your market, what is it, your, your wine sales uh, to date, that 39% is, is excellent. So that's normally you have at the very end, you have a push. That's when most of the income comes, yeah. Right, they go, oh, yeah, I forgot about the getting my ticket. So, Well, that's, that's why we run our Modesto B ads kind of late because that's when people tend to buy tickets and tend to start thinking about going to the events. And refinement that you have done over the last, what, four years, five years now? Five years, yeah. Um, has been uh, uh, enhancing the experience, and I, I appreciate it. Sue, I appreciate your work, too. I have a question. The wine cafe, is it in the street or is it on the sidewalk? It'll be on the sidewalk. In front of which businesses down there? Um, the businesses we're thinking about putting them in front of are all closed. They're vacant. Uh, I felt it was important not to put any activities in front of an open business. Okay. Don't you agree? Would that be better? Yeah, that's yeah. why I was asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who's um? Oh. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> they sound pretty interesting, so I'm looking forward to that. Cool. Um, who's going to be on the main stage? Uh, I can, I can look. I, I've got it on my phone, but I don't have it memorized. Um, but we have, I know that we have Triple D, for example. It's a local band that's going to be playing there, um, and we have about we have over two dozen bands playing at the event. Okay. Great, thank you. Good job. Thank you very much. Moving on to public comment at this time, members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda and within the subject matter jurisdiction of the City Council LRA Board. Individuals' comments will be limited to a maximum period of five minutes, and each person may speak once during this time. Time cannot be yielded to another. Under state law, matters presented during public comment cannot be discussed or acted upon. For record purposes, state your name and city of residence and make your comments directly to the LRA City Council. Do we have any public comments tonight? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I have good news for you and bad news. Which ones we like first? You got a choice? Okay. For the, for the good news is <clears throat> that there is a place on uh, McHenry Avenue that is selling marijuana. And it had called to my attention already twice that they don't have advertisements on their page, even though it's advertisement. But at this place, they have what it should be in the whole state of California. This product has intoxicating effects and maybe have it forming. Marijuana can impair concentration, coordination, and judgment. Do not operate a vehicle or machinery under the influence of this drug. There might be health risks associated with consumption of this product for use only by adults 21 and older. Keep out of the reach of children. I think that I'm going to be in touch, Mr. Um, Governor Jerry Brown, and then come down all, all the way down the ladder, because up the ladder, I see it doesn't work too well. <clears throat> Maybe the interest of the people who are under 21, and those are users um, for, for the recreation purposes, will wake up cold, you know? I had named already three or four different accidents, one of them involving a highway patrol who got killed, 
I had a uh, name of uh, some students who were in uh, Highway 880 by the Bay Area. <clears throat> a couple of them, I think, from Manteca. But I don't think that works on a time to so-called scare people. It's not to scare them. It's to tell them the facts. It's true what happened because all the individuals were under the influence of marijuana. <clears throat> on the uh, products that they had, medical marijuana, which was what it started with that, with that line, with a little hookup, you know. Well, it's only 10% in the states that haven't allowed. And some of those states only allow, up to now, medical marijuana. They don't have openly for recreational purposes. <laughs> so uh, this is the part that I would like for all of you to understand as uh, the business of marijuana got here already and uh, they don't have this type of uh, warning, and it's very serious warning. I don't know how you do about uh, your conscience being on the money instead of being on the wellness, the real wellness of the community, but um, that doesn't bring us any good. You watch, I give you three years. I'll be back, hopefully to God, I have life and health for that time. It's been a, almost a whole year, and everything seems to be working and rolling all right. But you know why? Because there is the money coming up. When the drama, or whatever you want to call it, the, or the people that get affected negatively, then maybe you will understand what a bad thing to do. Thank you very much. Any further public comment? Good evening, council members and Mayor O'Brien. My name is Vicki Holt and I'm the branch manager at the Riverbank Library. And we have a lot going on in October. So I wanna tell you about it. We have story time on Mondays at 10.30 and bilingual story time is on Tuesdays at 10.30. They both continue until the end of November. The Mayor Book Club for October is on October 8th at 11 o'clock following story time. For the month of October, we're displaying a big jar of candy for kids to guess how many candies are in the jar. And anybody, you don't have to be a kid, you can be a big kid, um, can guess. And whoever um, guesses the right amount or the closest without going over, they get the whole jar to take home. October Art Lab is on October 9th at 3.30. And they're going to be making sculptural faces out of cardboard and wood pieces, and then they get to paint them. Python Ron is coming to the library on October 10th, which is a Wednesday at 3.30. <coughs> Kids love his programs. It's fun, it's educational, and he brings huge snakes, lizards, tarantulas, bugs. It's fun. Um, on October 16th, the teens and tweens are going to be making pom-pom eyeballs out of colorful yarn. That's also at 3.30. We have um, two computer basic classes on Thursday, October 4th at 10.30 in the morning. And on October 18th, it's in the afternoon at 3.30. Space is limited, so call the library and sign up uh, at 869-7008. The Teen Book Club is meeting on October 19th at 3.30 to discuss the book, The Fifth Wave by Richard Yancey. Pizza and soda will be provided by the Friends of the Library. The book club, uh, the Grown Up Book Club, is reading Whistling Past the Graveyard by Susan Crandall. The book club meeting is on the fourth Tuesday of the month, which would be October 23rd at 4 o'clock. And lastly, we have an annual Halloween fun event um, on Halloween at 3.30, which is a Wednesday. Children are encouraged to come in costume. There are several crafts planned. They're gonna be making black cats and spiders, uh, and then they can spell their name on the spider web on the floor. And we'll be giving out candy. 
All these programs are free at the library, and it's because of our eighth of a cent dedicated sales tax that we're able to offer these services. Please stop by and visit us anytime, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Right. Hey, Vicki, um, could you start also a, a, another program? Uh, get three types of fruits and say, which one do you like best? And because he mentioned candy eight times. Did I'd like I? to start uh, doing fruits and veggies. Well, it's okay. Okay. Shall we do that for your mayor book club? You know, that would work fine for me. Um, <coughs> uh, I got something from the uh, AMA today asking me, how healthy is our city? I'm thinking, we're a hill city, but we need to do better. Okay. Okay. So we can talk about that. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. We thank will. you. All right. Any further comment? Seeing none, we'll move on to the consent calendar consisting of item 3A, wave reading, 3B, approval of June 25th, 2018, special city council minutes. Item 3B1, approval of September 11th, 2018, city council meeting and local redevelopment authority board meetings. Item 3B2, approval of September 18th, 2018, special joint city Council and Planning Commission meeting minutes. Item 3C, a resolution to adopt the 2018-2019 schedule of park amenities rentals. Item 3D, a resolution adopting a reference fair political practice commissions Title II, Division VI, California Code Section 18730 and 18730.1 to the 2018 Conflict of Interest Code list of designated city positions and the related economic interest disclosure categories. Item 3E, award bid for the Patterson Road sidewalk project to Ross C. Carroll, Inc., and authorized execution of future change orders. Do I have anyone wishing to uh, pull any consent item? And from the public, wishes to comment on any item? Saying none, I bring it back to the council for consideration. I make a motion we accept the consent calendar. I second. We have a motion to approve and a second the consent. Council Authority Members Fossey. Yes. Campbell. Yes. Jones Cruz. Yes. Vice Mayor Chair Barbara Martinez. Yes. Mayor Chair O'Brien. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item 5.1, continuance of a notice public hearing to consider a resolution approving and adopting a five-year capital improvement plan for fiscal year 2018 through 2023. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> staff uh, noticed this item, uh, and as the CIP document is, is complex, and there's a lot of strategy and thought that goes uh, goes into it, primarily from uh, Kathleen Cleek and, <coughs> and other department heads that are working on various infrastructure projects, whether it be in water or sewer or in streets um, or in facilities. And um, as we got closer to the public hearing date, there were still some outstanding items that we need to address. So we'd like to request a continuance so we can make sure that it's uh, complete before it's presented. All right, before I open, do I need a, uh, a consent from the council to continue it or just well, do we, it by we, through public? We open it and then we close tonight's portion and then you take a motion to continue. Okay. All right. This is a public hearing open to the public for comment on the CIP for the fiscal year 2018 through 23. Seeing no public comment, I close public com comment. And by a roll call vote, continue the public hearing to the next regular city council meeting on October 9th, 2018. We just need a motion and a second to do that. Then the I'll make a motion vote. that we uh, approve item 5.1 for continuance. I'll second it. We have a motion. To continue item 5.1 and a second to the city council meeting on October 9th, 2018. Council members Fossey. Yes. Campbell. Yes. John Cruz. Yes. Vice Mayor Barbara Martinez. Yes. Mayor O'Brien. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item 6.1, a resolution authorizing the mayor to execute and enter into a new agreement for the city manager services and authorizing a budget amendment for fiscal year 2018 through 2019. Mayor Council, uh, 
It's my pleasure to introduce Kim Horiichi, uh, a new addition to our office, already a valuable member who will be presenting this item for you tonight. Thank you so much, Mr. Holland and members, um, Mr. Mayor, uh, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, the city contracted in approximately January 2017 for city manager Sean Scully Services. There was in that agreement a requirement that there be a 5% increase uh, the following year on the understanding that he would only get that if he achieved a satisfactory or higher performance evaluation in January of 2018. January of 2018, he received a higher than satisfactory performance evaluation, and so the city now wishes to contract or amend his previous contract uh, for services as a city manager. Those terms are laid out in the staff report, and of course I can answer any questions in regards to those terms. Um, but the recommendation is effectively to approve the uh, new agreement, which amends the original January 2017 agreement in four ways, which again, I can answer any questions in specific, but are laid out in the staff report, and that the uh, city council authorize and direct the mayor to execute the agreement for Mr. Scully's continued services. Thank you. Are there any questions um, on the staff report? to uh, Kim. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Is there anyone from the public wishes to comment on item 6.1? Seeing none, I bring it back. Um, we collectively uh, believe that you've done a superb job um, and we appreciate your hard work in putting up with all of us. So by that, I'd like to see if anyone would like to make a motion in a second. I'd like to make a motion that we accept item 6.1 as stated. I second. We have a motion to approve in a second on item 6.1. Council members Fossey. Yes. Campbell. Yes. Jones Cruz. Yes. Vice Mayor Barbara Martinez. Yes. Mayor O'Brien. Yes. Motion passes 5-0. Item 6.2, a workshop and discussion on downtown incentive programs for business. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to point out that even if you hadn't approved the last item, I still would give this uh, <laughs> presentation just as a freebie. Um, <laughs> so um, I haven't signed yet. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so I better do a good job here. Um, mm -hmm. So um, there's been a lot of discussion over the years, I'm told, and, and I've been involved in my short term <laughs> here with regard to downtown and it's a it's a really common issue especially in Central Valley communities though not just here about what do we do about downtown um, the thing I always like to say about downtowns is that um, the question that people ask from time time and time again is why isn't it like it was in 1972 and how come things are not as vibrant as they once were when downtown was the commercial core and center of the community. And there's a lot of reasons for that. The primary reason is that um, that was 40 or 50 years ago, depending on when you're asking. Uh, another reason is a company called Amazon.com. Another reason is a bunch of corporations like Target and Walmart and, and a lot of the big box stores that have, have unfortunately in all communities to some degree have sort of um, uh, pushed out a lot of business from local shops uh, because of price competition primarily. Um, that is changing a little. There is sort of a trend backwards towards uh, l buying local and, and supporting smaller local businesses, even if maybe it's a little bit more expensive to do so. Um, but the, the fact remains that downtowns in general across America are struggling because they were not built with the idea of big box stores or the idea of the internet becoming what it's become. And so what a lot of communities are struggling with right now is what do we make downtown now that, that those days have passed, what do we make it for the future? And so the council's had a lot of discussion about this many different times. And during strategic planning this year, one of the things that was brought up was, um, was let's have a discussion about what we can do in a more targeted effort to uh, attract um, specific kinds of businesses to the downtown that we think would be additive to the experience. What other things can we do to make 
uh, this downtown that we have, which is very nice by anyone's standards, a little bit more vibrant. And, and there's a lot of different opinions about that. So tonight what we're going to do is it, the idea is um, I don't want to send my staff or, or spend my time going off on, on um, expeditions of different programs we can do without some kind of clear guidance from the council about what sorts of things we think are good ideas and what sorts of things we don't think that we should spend our time doing. Um, there, uh, there was a similar discussion to this about three or four years ago, and the City Council instituted some programs that actually we still are, are operating under, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so the purpose of the workshop, as I said, is to sort of jumpstart the dialogue about what we could do, what we can explore, um, hopefully provide some direction on some preferred methods and alternatives. Most importantly to me is to discuss what types of businesses and land uses should be targeted within the incentive program. It does not do any good to have this wide, a wide-reaching program that applies to everyone because <coughs> you're not really um, going after the kinds of uses that really could help make your downtown a little bit more vibrant and provide services not only to the people that live in Riverbank but also the people who live in and around the downtown. And then we'll discuss some next steps and we will be back with some actual programs for you to evaluate and decide on. So what do we already do? Um, there's um, my predecessor, um, Jill Anderson, had a program that has been approved by the City Council that we, we don't use it a lot because there's not a, a ton of activity, but we do use it. Um, and it included some waiver and deferrals of specific development standards that don't or uh, do not or mini only minimally apply to the business use. So example of that would be, um, you know, we have general standards about public infrastructure that you have to install that, you know, if you were developing a piece of dirt, you'd have to put in um, certain infrastructure that's usually very expensive. And so in some cases, we'll look at situations in the downtown, especially in remodel kind of projects and say, you know, technically the code would say that that applies here, but we are going to defer or waive those because it, practically it doesn't make any sense. And, and we have to understand that these are buildings that are in some cases 80 years or older. Uh, and so applying a blanket standard across the board like you would in a brand new uh, project really doesn't make sense for the downtown. So that's one, uh, one way. That, uh, obviously, Council approved the additional signage considerations recently. Uh, deferral of certain development standards to a later date. We talked a little bit about that. So sometimes when something's approved, for example, uh, one of the cases we've had recently is we have standards with regard to trash enclosures. Um, the types of trash enclosures we'd really like to see that are quality and make the downtown look nice are not cheap. And so sometimes when a project's trying to get off the ground, we will defer that into the future so that they can get their business open and generate some revenue to pay for, for those. Uh, we have uh, mural programs that are on the books that you still see here in the downtown area when people aren't painting over them. Uh, future electronic, uh, supposed to say sign representation that we're working on currently. Sue's working on that. And um, the one I'm most proud of is advocating and facilitating new business uh, or remodel projects. So um, one project that I'm proud of that's just getting started this week is Pizza Plus is moving over to the new Landon's, excuse me, the old Landon's building. And they're essentially gutting the space and remodeling it for uh, a larger, better, nicer restaurant. Um, and it's sort of an institution here in Riverbank. And to kind of give just a very brief snip of that, um, if you rewound about a year when the business owner had that idea, it started from literally just an idea and not clarity about how it was going to be funded or how it was going to be designed and how expensive it was going to be. I mean, these, these are incredibly expensive to renovate an old building. And we, <coughs> some council members and staff, have kind of stepped that applicant through the process, helped get him in touch with people that can help him with funding, helped uh, find creative ways to be flexible in our code to get the project off the ground. And I, I believe on Monday they actually started the first steps of construction, which is a, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it's a very big deal for, for our little downtown. Um, so then the question, I guess, is what could we do? And so programs, if you do some research, really fall into two different categories. There's aesthetic improvements, so things like facade remodel, volunteer painting programs, upgrading of public aesthetics such as landscaping in the downtown area. That's one way to increase value and, and to, to drum up some support and excitement for the downtown. 
And the second uh, program would be would fall more into sort of more generally what we're talking about tonight, but both are on the board, business incentives. So programs that are designed f to target specific types of commercial businesses that are desirable, desirable in the downtown area. So I threw a bunch of ideas up on this slide just to brainstorm the and jumpstart some of the discussion amongst the council and community not representing that I think any of them are really great or really bad ideas. All of them have their pluses and minuses. Um, so some ideas would be permit and fee reduction or waiver programs for specific types of business businesses, business license fee reduction, uh, small business loan programs, facade remodel programs, community volunteer projects, streamlined processes for downtown community events, increased city lead uh, marketing of vacant downtown tenant spaces. So some cities sort of, um, when you have issues with getting some commercial interest in your downtown, some cities will actually take the lead of being the cheerleader for uh, vacant spaces and, and try to coordinate those. And then um, reimbursement programs for public improvements. And that would typically be on like infill, meaning vacant properties that, that are building within your downtown. So, um, as we're discussing this, here's a couple considerations I thought were important. The most important one to me is what types of businesses and uses should be targeted for these types of pro uh, programs. Um, I've talked with a couple community members, some that live down in, in this area, and one of the things I hear over and over again is that it would be nice to have more of the service type uses in our downtown so that, uh, like, 20 or 30 years ago, they could go downtown to get their medical checkups and their dental checkups or to do some of their banking um, or to, you know, visit a pharmacy even. Um, it, it, those kinds of things build a sense of community in a downtown, and so I think they're really important. And then you have some of the more um, people-attracting options, maybe uh, restaurants, entertainment-type uses, and then just your general sales tax uh, retail. Um, the more, in my mind, the more focused the target, the higher likelihood we have to succeed. Um, the the second is obviously the money question. It's everything comes down to money in some sense. Um, what are the budgetary implications? Any subsidy or incentive is going to create an impact, and so it must be weighed with the potential economic and community benefit of the new business. Uh, the the point of that is just to say that anything that is decided to be done has a cost and the question for the council is what are we what is the community slash council interested in investing into the possibility of going after and being a little bit more aggressive with regard to economic development downtown um, depending on the feedback from council um, we would take that feedback and craft some pilot programs for council consideration we've been really successful in the past at least during my time here with pilot programs uh, because it gives us the ability to try things out and come back and report to you about what works and what doesn't work and amend if necessary. And then if council approves a pilot program, we would implement and we would recommend a six-month trial where we come back to you and say, these, are, these programs are working really well or they're not working and here's why, um, and, and perhaps amend therein. <coughs> and that is the end of the presentation because really what, it, what the item is about is discussion amongst the, the council and community about what do we want to do and how aggressive do we want to be in doing it? And I'd be happy to answer any questions um, or address any comments. Well, one of the areas I think we need to do is streamline our um, license and permitting um, uh, processes. Uh, there is a lot of uh, online items that are um, uh, tools that we could uh, employ. But the thing that we need to do is build a, a yes attitude in this community on uh, if someone says, I want to open a business, why yes. Here are your steps, and we need to uh, direct you on how to open it and lower the barriers to make sure that they can get them accomplished a lot faster than some of the things that uh, we've done in the past. Um, develop a path, path to opening their business even if it is an interim process. So these are the, um, the, the staff things that should be done. I don't know what leverage we could have on the absentee landlords in improving their buildings, but uh, some of them have been in need of dire repair uh, for the, uh, at least the last 20 years. And some uh, of the occupants could tell you exactly 
uh, some of the problems that have been down there. You're not going to get anyone of quality. I shouldn't say that. Let me rephrase that. Mm -hmm. You're not going to retain high quality businesses if the landlords won't take care of their buildings. So I don't know how we do that other than start uh, uh, inspecting their businesses um, and then determine what needs to be done and give them uh, a timeline to complete it before they have some type of um, penalty phase. Um, we have a, a cafe or a, a, a bakery that was just closed, never opened, but um, you know, that would be first of an attraction. If you lower any fees to get someone there, it would be perfect. But you need probably more service-like. But you take a look at the trend. Uh, it's not, no longer the little pharmacy that they used to have or the little bank that used to be here. There's now the banking banks are, are much larger. The pharmacies, to stay alive, has to diversify their, their program. So if you're thinking of putting a CVS downtown, uh, that probably would not work. So it would have to be uh, smaller. And if you take a look at some of the revitalized downtowns, Livermore, uh, to be example, um, I believe uh, Pleasanton had one, uh, and they went more f towards the entertainment where the smaller buildings can be a, a unique experience, whether it's a craft beer or, or a small cafe. Um, I, I would like to say, let's get you know, a, a, a big box here, but that's, this isn't the location for it. So um, I think in attracting the businesses, we, we start looking at, at the, the entertainment, food and entertainment uh, area from my perspective and go from there. Um, as I stated before, to bring them in, we need to develop a yes attitude and uh, a yes mentality and lowering the barriers on how to get a license and get them started. There's been that attitude, and I'm not certain, uh, certain if it still exists. It doesn't matter if they open right now, they're rich, they're opening a business. But every day that they're closed, they're losing money. So they, we need to uh, streamline that process and move them along. And um, I believe that we all have discussed this uh, along those same lines. Uh, I'm not speaking, I'm speaking for myself. But I know that uh, we have spoke about this at strategic planning, as well as uh, other meetings that we've we've worked in this before. But I'm not going to be the only one speaking. Um, one thing that I know, Sean, you and I have talked about um, that I, you kind of touched base a little bit about it was the new signage stuff that we had going. But what I didn't see on it was to have a a collective sign like downtown businesses. Um, and on, a, on the highway, actually a city sign, not from a business putting something out, but having our downtown businesses with maybe a list of their names on it. I know you, got, you and I have discussed some of those, so I'd like to see that on there. I know you touched base just a little bit, but a little more on, on advertising the downtown businesses that are down there already would help. I've had a couple of ideas for downtown that I know I've floated um, by Sean. One of them is um, Kaiser. Wouldn't it be nice to have a substation for Kaiser maybe downtown where they just had um, just a doctor that you would see and maybe a lab, uh, a lab to take to do blood tests. Um, another idea, um, just like what the mayor touched on, I think if we had some nice restaurants downtown, um, some nice um, not per se bars, but cafes, uh, maybe some high, um, not high price, but some nice uh, craft type stores where you could go and buy homemade items that were already done, um, like they have in Pleasanton and in Livermore. Um, they have some really nice shops for people to just walk through at night. Um, 
something different than what is already existing in another location in Crossroads, somewhere where parents can come and kind of take a couple hours from the kids, have a nice dinner and walk. Um, one of the things that, that I have been moving forward with with Sean is trying to make the, um, the downtown area um, a little bit more presentable. One of the things that we're working on with the school, the high school right now is um, painting all the electrical boxes, you know, offering the high school kids an opportunity to possibly um, present what they would want to paint it and then we would have them go and paint it. Something that obviously is presentable, but it would bring a little bit of art into downtown. Uh, maybe also do that for some, um, what, is it? what are they called? The words escaping me on the side of a building. Mural. Mural. Um, bringing some of that type of stuff downtown where we're using local artists, local people, um, using, this platform over here more often to bring people down once you start bringing them down um, then more businesses will want to come but one thing i have heard also mayor is that the tenants are not happy with the landlords that the people that own the buildings don't want to do anything with them and any opportunities that we can find whether it's through grants or loan programs for them to be pushed to bring their their building up to a standard that the city develops would also help to bring people down um, it's a great area we've got a lot of space a lot of nice buildings uh, especially the one over here on the corner it's a beautiful building um, i'd like to see us bring some stuff in and somehow do some marketing um, i'd like to see a welcome packet Maybe like you do, like, I don't know how many people remember. Okay, I'm going to show my age. Welcome Wagon. Does anybody remember Welcome Wagon? When you would move into a neighborhood, they bring you a big packet of what, what's <coughs> in the city and coupons and things. Maybe we develop a welcome packet for new businesses that are interested. You know, this is how you do this. This is how you do that. This, is, this person can help you here. Um, and that would help them through the permitting and, and coming in and working process. Just my suggestion. Well, I had um, thought about what kinds of businesses um, I would like to see that we currently don't have. For instance, uh, we don't have an um, ATM machine close by or, as we said, a bank. Um, again, I would like the idea of a, a restaurant that we could sit outside and, and you know, eat. And we have the, um, the cheese company and if we could get them to maybe think about how they can expand their business and maybe partner with a craft beer that might want to come down and just, you know, maybe they could partner and sell some of their cheese or something, whatever. And then I also um, was thinking about if we get a developer that is looking for a site and the site that maybe will have the space and square footage that they're looking at and they need to tear down that building if we could offer some kind of demolition assistance um, in you know tearing down that building um, and then try to get uh, looking at enterprise I know that they don't have enterprise zones again but looking at what our our area is considered is it an opportunity zone where we can you know um, market that and then also with the CDBG grants if we let developers know that we have CDBG grants. Maybe the developers can provide matching funds. That might be an idea. Um, some that are, you know, like ready to spend their money, like right now instead of jumping through hoops. Um, what else did I have? Oh, with the Opportunity Zone um, designation under the Tax uh, Cuts and Jobs Act, which was finalized for 2017, investors can cut um, the amount of tax that they are owed on their capital gains and um, then they can reinvest in um, in opportunity funds that's something that I don't think is quite finalized to the federal government but they have thrown it out there as uh, something that might be available to developers um, let's see what else did I have oh and as far as um, painting uh, the front of the buildings 
Um, I was thinking about maybe an ideal to make it mandatory, but that that they do something about the building and paint it, but maybe we could offer an assistance for painters or, you know, we don't have any nonprofit groups that maybe this could be a, a you know, an activity for a nonprofit group, but, um, you know, and then if we develop something like a neighborhood commercial revitalization program or something like that to give what we're what we're talking about and what we're doing a new name when you sometimes when you talk about um downtown improvement plans people get tired of hearing that word you know it's like almost like taboo because people you know you hear it you start it up you don't do anything with it it goes dead so i just was thinking maybe we need to call it something new and something different to get the hype up about it. And I think maybe that's all I have. I just want to add a couple of things. I've spoken to several other downtown um, around the area. <coughs> One of them's Lodi. And when they redid their downtown many years ago, it sat empty for about five years. And just nothing happened. They had all the buildings, they put the re new infrastructure in and whatnot, until a winery came in and started wine tasting. And that was the stimulus that started bringing people in. Um, we need to look for some bigger core businesses that can put a draw in there. We've got some one big building over here, the Masonic Lodge, that could be a very big restaurant or even uh, a theater restaurant type thing, uh, just like Newman has. But we need to not only just have the little or small businesses. We need these core businesses that draw people downtown because I've seen a lot of small businesses start up downtown and they don't get the foot traffic because there's not enough to draw them here and then they disappear after six months, eight months, or a year because they're just struggling. So I'd like us to think about that and start investigating, possibly looking around to see if we can find some other like microbreweries or something of that nature that might be willing to come over and take a chance on say that building down at the Masonic Lodge. We also know that the Del Rio hopefully is going to be completed someday because that could be a business that could attract more too. And the, what Lodi told me was it sort of mushroomed after that build, that bigger business came in. It sort of started mushrooming and attracting the antique stores and the other types of business because there was foot traffic now. And that created more foot traffic. So we need to look at that as well as everything my fellow council members have looked at. All right, let's, um, let's take a look at what our core purpose is, to provide municipal services. Um, and we can lower the barriers, but we can't do the marketing to draw businesses in. We should have a Chamber of Commerce that does that for us. We can give incentives, but we don't, we, when, we're not in the business of going out seeking new um, uh, business downtown or elsewhere. So we have to provide the opportunities. So if we go after certain groups, that would be fine, but we need a conduit for that. The city provides municipal services. And in that, by lowering the barriers, by streamlining the, the, the process and saying, hey, we're, we're business friendly, we can provide the services that we need to the business who decide to come on downtown. Um, this would be great if we had a BID, Business Industrial District, uh, Incentive District, but we do not. We don't have a Chamber of Commerce down here. Uh, or if they are, they're very limited. Um, but if we employ the services of the Small Business Administration uh, to say, okay, what can you help us with? We'll provide that as information to those inquiring. How are we going to get the information out? We need to get that information out through our website and, and others on how we can attract businesses. Opportunity Stanislaus is supposed to be helping. We pay good money to that organization, and I haven't seen, I haven't seen results yet. Um, Institute of Local Governments came down with a good master plan. Um, 
but again, we need to have it initiated by the private sector. So I think if we revisit the uh, Opportunity Status Laws and ILG to get the vision out there and again streamlining our process to get businesses down here and put pressure on those who are absentee landlords, even local landlords, to get their buildings up to speed so they can be rented. Um, I don't know if we can have a um, an additional um, incentives for them to, to fix them up. Um, mills tax may come to, to mind, um, but then that takes away from our income. Uh, mills tax is providing a district uh, lower property taxes for a period of time to improve the area. But that may be something that we, sh we could look at, and that would provide incentives for absentee landlords to do something to it so they'll increase their value, increase their property taxes, and pay for the mills. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's, it's a round robin on that one. So um, I, we have to come up with some way to where I guess we're involved but without jeopardizing our um, primary purpose. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> I've got a lot of notes. Um, so I guess what I would say is that um, I'm going to try to sum up and then please jump in and correct me if I'm incorrect. Um, it sounds to me like the primary interest at this point is some sort of program, stream, a streamlined approach for downtown businesses. And by the way, when I say downtown, I kind of mean our core area here that's south of, uh, well, yeah, south of the highway. Um, so it doesn't just necessarily need to be you know, our, our main street. But um, so we could come up with some concepts that we think might assist with that. You know, to be honest with you, we every time that someone walks in with a, a business idea downtown, we try to the greatest extent we can to kind of help them through the process, m even maybe a little bit more than we do in other commercial areas because we just understand the constraints that are downtown. Um, but we can come up with some ideas along those lines. I guess what I would ask, too, is like we were talking about earlier, um, general ideas and consensus on the kinds, the specific types of businesses that, that you want to attract because what Councilmember Campbell said is absolutely correct. Success breeds success. So you succeed in attracting a couple businesses that might not otherwise have come here because maybe you have some favorable, maybe you do some fee deferrals or some fee waivers for them on their permits. Maybe when they're deciding, if you have a local business deciding between Oakdale and, and Escalon and Riverbank and they want to be somewhere in this area, and we do hear this from time to time, maybe it's enough to push them over the edge if there happens to be this program where we could say, oh, well, you know, if you're opening a business in the downtown area, we have this program for you, depending on the type of your use. And, uh, you know, that might be just enough to push them over the edge to start one here versus maybe one of those other locations. Um, so I, so that concept, we can come up with a couple different, like, um, 500 feet models where you kind of look at it and you say, okay, Sean, I like this idea, but let's tweak it to be for these specific types of uses and back our way in there. Because I know that it's a lot to kind of digest in just one workshop, but ideally, I think that you'd be the most successful if you had targeted types of businesses you want and you're looking for. Because normal, th many businesses are going to, the, the ones that we're not going to struggle to get downtown are the things that we have already. So, you, you know, the live hair salons and things like that, those are going to continue to come downtown because, uh, you know, there's a location. It's the ones that are a little more difficult to attract because maybe they're a little more expensive to get off the ground, things like that, that I think you want to try, you may want to try to incentivize. Right. And I do know that the uh, current Chamber of Commerce president is working with Opportunity Stanislaus to try to come up with uh, kind of like a map uh, of what they're going to do to help us, will help the Chamber to uh, attract businesses. So they're working on that now. We do have a representative on the Chamber of Commerce I know. right now. 
Yes, I know. Okay. I don't see them here. Okay. This is open to the public. Good evening again. <clears throat> My name is Ramon Bermudez. Um, I'm going to complete <clears throat> 25 years in this city. And there were changes. 7,252 is on the sign. You know, there were only two signs. In the entrances were considered closed road, and I don't remember if it was Patterson Road. Now there is like five. <clears throat> Welcome to Riverbank. Now go home. Um, so the thing was that you're discussing about these businesses, and I was, this came up to my mind of somebody very brilliant did, or some group of people, I should say, you want to include yourselves on it? Let me know. Because uh, the businesses that were the, the uh, Olamu plant, the uh, let me, let me get it right, <laughs> Riverbank, uh, what is it? Industrial Center, something like that, right? Industrial and, complex. And it was, it was uh, uh, still uh, some left of, of artillery uh, munition being made or something like that when I got here. And then, uh, then they say that they were gonna have everything closed down and uh, they weren't gonna have anything in there, and so on and so forth. So it started growing, um, I'll say 15 years ago. Started getting a little bit better, 10 years ago. If, I, didn't, I, I don't wanna say the trick because uh, the reasoning on behind it, how did they come about to the applicants for a place at, at the center, apply pretty much the same operation, or again, I don't want to use the, the word trick because there is no such thing as a trick in business like that, but if they use certain incentives to attract that kind of uh, businesses that are in it right now, what are they, like 22 or something like that, then it, it increased like within five years, I think, increased like about uh, double, like from 11 to 22 or something like that. Uh, and somebody there has a lot to do with the choice of businesses, what kind of businesses they were, where they were gonna fit for the industrial area. Then take those ideas and apply it to the downtown area for, for businesses that are other than industrial, of course. You're talking about the uh, little patios with thing of cafes and, and, and so on. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's nice, but, um, I think that that we have we have a uh, um, the unfortunately the, the uh, competition of of the place at uh, uh, the Clary Bell and and, uh, and Ogdale Road and we have here at Patterson Road and and, uh, and uh, Ogdale Road and all of that uh, we're looking from outside of Ryan's Market one time uh, talking about 20 years ago maybe and the empty lots over there, uh, where CVS, et cetera, are right now, and where the Chevron station it was empty lots. And uh, uh, men with the uh, last name Castillo, I think was, uh, that has been here many years in Riverbank, he was saying, why, why isn't there some people, you know, that either from Riverbank or from outside Riverbank to start investing and, and putting stores and putting, you know, a theater, they, you didn't even think about the Galaxy Theater at the time. Uh, and, and those uh, empty lots started filling in and we, with good things I ended up working at the Chevron station for like six years uh, part time and another eight years altogether. But uh, those were wasting when it didn't, it didn't have those people with the ideas, you know, or had to fill in those places. But in this one, it, it's not re revitalization. It's, it's uh, to put something new, something that it, is not there, uh, and uh, 
those, are, those ideas are good. Or how do you get, again, those businesses that fit in the industrial, you were able to attract them and keep them. And there is some that has been already years in the making, you know, they're very eventful. And in the downtown, then, then apply the same, the same type of, of uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, creativity <laughs> that, that they put in that one. I thank want to thank you. Thank um, you. Your time is up, but you hit on something important, I think. Uh, not only bring something new, but think outside the box. Um, instead of trying to attract a certain in, um, type of business, but think outside the box of how, you, how do you attract them downtown. Um, you're not going to be competing, again, with the other shopping centers, um, but you, we had a chance to bring in um, Jilton offices downtown. They were going to take all the empty portions of it and build their offices, but it was determined uh, that we didn't want that type of business downtown. Well, that's not what we should be doing. We should be looking, how do we attract, uh, you know, and service buildings, and how do we support them downtown? But again, we just provide the incentives. So now we have to attract someone who has the vision to help develop this downtown. But I want to thank you for your input. It is, it is uh, you know, like, like I say, uh, on the idea, like I said, I was just seeing how uh, these creative people came either from outside or, or San Luis County or from even outside of California, maybe, that uh, created that in, uh, I'll say, in, in 15 years. I won't even say 20. Okay. You know, because it, it was 1999 when I started at the, at the Chevron. And we're in, in uh, what, 20 years later? Uh, and that, that's when that one started. Uh, it's, it's a good idea, a good point to go on to what type of business fit in here. And the people will keep on coming. We will keep on coming. All right. Yep, yep, thank, thank you. you. Your, your point is well taken. Any further public comment? Good evening, Council. My name is Rick McGinnis. I'm taking off my reporter hat and putting on my citizen and former city council member hat. Uh, just to remind you that at one time, years ago, the council had a citizens committee that was focused on downtown revitalization. I was a member of it as, as representative from the council and as a citizen at large. And back when we had redevelopment going on for us, before the governor stole that idea and all the revenue, we had means with which to develop that. And we were becoming more successful and we had a lot of input from the community. Business, there was a business representative, a resident representative, and of course, a council representative. And that all has seemed to just fade away. And I think it's a, an idea you might revitalize to help with your revitalization. Thank you. Any further public comment? I was also on that revitalization committee. I rep we had the seat representing downtown residents, and I agree it needs to come back. That committee had only businesses, representatives, re residents, representatives, all from downtown because this was our downtown. Not only the businesses down here, but the residents, they're stronger and tougher than this whole city. We went through the redevelopment and the blight crap the city put on us. We went through the revitalization when the city turned the backs on us and when the businesses couldn't get customers in or anything. We, we survived all of that. And now we get what? What are we gonna do to bring people out there back in? What are you gonna do I'm going to ask all of you, even though nobody's representing downtown, what are you going to do for the residents that are down here now? Because I haven't heard anything about what you're going to do for us. Read the view, vision in the downtown Pacific plan. It doesn't agree with anything of what you've been saying here tonight. You, we made a lot of promises that didn't happen. What are you going to do for us? What are you going to do for those businesses that are still hanging on that have been here all this time? Why can't this thing wait until we have at least one representative on this council for the represents downtown? Because none of you guys live down here. You don't know what we went through. You don't know what it's like down here. 
We don't have services. You can bring all these people down here on these cars to have fun and entertainment and restaurants and stuff. We got to get in our cars and go somewhere else because there's no services down here. You talked about a bank, um, Vice Mayor, an ATM. There was an ATM in this one across the street, and it was not. It was the outside part of the bank, in that little door. I think goes upstairs, part of some. If that's still there, why can't you just revitalize the ATM in there? There was an ATM there. If Savemark can have a little bank in it, that bank's bigger than that little bank Savemark had. You keep saying there's not enough people down there. You don't have any idea how many people live down here. No idea. These buildings are old, they're historical. Some of them are over 100 years old, Masonic Hall, some of these down here. You don't just go bulldoze them. You don't just tear them down. You get people that want to come in here and you keep talking about these other cities and downtowns and how they look and all that. Well, they saved their historical buildings. They kept their history. You guys could care less about our history. So I'm going to ask you that you table this thing until we have at least one representative on this council for downtown that thinks about the residents and the businesses that are already here. And Mayor O'Brien, I take exception to your high quality comment. That has no place on the council, and it's totally unacceptable. And I would have hoped at least one of you other council members would have said something about it. Any further public comment? Okay, I bring it back. You have been provided the guidance. If there's any clarity you need, please. Um, one question. Um, well, one comment and one question. Um, one of the things that's been mentioned a few times that on the dais and in, in public comment that I think needs to be r real clear is <coughs> um, businesses are driven by economics, by market. Um, so when we talk about why we don't have certain things, let's take the ATM example, um, it's not because one day the city decided we don't like an ATM down here so we're going to go shut you down. If businesses close downtown, it's specifically because they are either, you know, either the person's moving on with their life and they're not going to run the business anymore, or more likely, they're not making enough money to to stay open. Um, and so, I think it's really important that the expectations of what we're going to achieve here are sort of suited towards trying to provide opportunity and letting the businesses runs with those opportunities versus, um, you know. One of the things I hear from the public a lot is, well, why don't you get a insert business here? Well, if it was that easy and, and those businesses thought they could make a good living downtown, they would already be here. These are, you know, that's, that's the point of, of vacant retail area. Um, so I think just having that expectation is one of the things. And then I guess the question I have for council is there's been, I thought, I thought it was a really good idea, the concept of having kind of like a subcommittee or a downtown group to kind of ferret out a lot of these ideas and form them into something more full-fledged for you to all consider seems to make sense, but I wanted to know if that's something you want to see proceeded with or, or not. We went with that uh, to form a BID because there is no RDA any longer. And the interest in that was they came down and they disbanded. They had no interest in, in pursuing it. They expect that the city is going to attract the new businesses. And that is not the role of the city. But we can facilitate uh, and lower the barriers to get new businesses down here. Like refurbishing the historical, not tearing them down. No one even mentioned that. Um, the uh, high quality people will stay if the buildings are, are good. They'll leave if they're not good. And that's one thing that we still have to get our hands around. Can we force them to fix their buildings up? I don't think we can. But we can put them as health hazards. What does that do? They, they, have, they could kick the bil businesses out. So, um, and so, Mayor, just so I'm clear, so what about the concept of maybe not necessarily a committee that, you know, um, is going to create some sort of district or anything like that. What about maybe like a work group or a working committee that, you know, I take this back, I'll take a look at a bunch of different programs and I can present different ideas to them so that they're fleshed out a little bit more before they get to the council. Is there any interest in that or? I like the idea. Yeah. The mayor's right. There was a, a group that got together. 
<laughs> and they didn't fly with it. Right, and there I was on the uh, reasons that one of the reasons on. they didn't. If you didn't want to talk to the downtown to businesses, why they can give you some information why they didn't participate in that. So yeah. they, yeah, and just for one clarification, there is an ATM downtown. If you guys shop in Fair Deal, there's an ATM right in Fair Deal that's right downtown. So. And I was on that committee um, at the, in the final throes of it um, for the revitalization of downtown. And a lot of it took money that's not available. RDA by that time was going away. It had not yet, but the writing was on the wall. Uh, and some of it took, was going to take money. Right now, uh, what is it, 6% of our, our tax structure for... Um, um, property taxes go to repay RDA, About. and and uh, well, we got pretty streets. That's what we got. So we need to be very. Co I I would agree. Let's uh, reform the the uh, business, but we're going to have to establish the roles, boundaries, and responsibilities because um, we're constrained by by finances, just like yeah. businesses are when they move to some place. So maybe what I'll do instead of formalizing that is I'll, I'll just get out and, and um, do some more just community outreach like I've already done, come together with a bunch of different ideas. And then next time when I come to you, you're going to see sort of a menu of different I programs with detail, specifics. How much is it going to cost? How is it going to work? And you can pick them apart and decide if we like them or not, and then we'll go with the ones that, that the council agrees on. Does that work? It works. Item 7.1, staff comments. Um, Sue, can you give uh, a little update on the Haunted Hayride since that's coming up? And I know we're probably still looking for volunteers. Right. Actually, there's a couple things I'd like to say. Um, I'm glad you called me up because the circus came to town today. And they're setting up, and if anyone want in the community wants to buy tickets, if you buy them from the Parks and Rec uh, tomorrow or the next day before the first show, which is Thursday night, we get a higher percentage, and that all goes to swim lessons, scholarships, and sharks and mermaids and all that good stuff. So if anyone wants, wants to come and buy the tickets, the I went to the circus last year. It's fun. It was a good circus. It's not the one that we had, although they were good too. This is a new one. It's a new show. So um, come on down for that. I think it's Julia, fifteen dollars for adults and ten for children. And I think you get some coupons for the kids too, free tickets if you buy them in advance. But um, so that, and then we have um, the haunted hay ride coming up. The well, we have the cheese and wine, which we already talked about. Then we have the hay ride, which is the twenty sixth and twenty seventh. We do need volunteers to be guides. If any of you want to be guides or anybody in the community, um, we're looking for more sites. Julia has been working really hard on that. Um, and then right after that, we have the Christmas parade, and we do need help with the Christmas parade. So if there's anybody out there that wants to be part of a committee, we used to have a Christmas parade committee, and that's kind of dissolved as well. And we need to get that back just for some help on that whole process of the parade. So all of those things, um, just give us a call, and if anybody wants to help us, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Okay, Council Authority Member um, Fossey. I don't have anything tonight. Uh, Campbell. I'd just like to encourage everybody out there to look at our nonprofits in the community. Some of them, like the Historical Society, the Friends of Jacob Myers Park, the Rotary, they're really in need of people, younger people. They're dying at the vine because they're just old. And these are good organizations that have done a lot, but somehow you need to talk to people and, and we're besides us and encourage some other people to try to get into some of these organizations because, as I say, they're just withering at the vine. And as we lose those, we lose a big portion of things that can help get this community better. So think about it. There's several in the city and they all need a little bit of help, except the women's club. They're doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Council Authority Member Jones Cruz. The only thing I just wanted to mention was if you got a chance to come downtown to the um, sip and stroll that went on last Friday night, um, it was a week ago, 
I'm losing track of my days already. <laughs> I guess I am getting old. <laughs> um, there was a good turnout. It was the second time we'd done it. There was more people than the first time we did it. We'd still like to see more businesses participate. Um, it was really a beautiful evening. You could ask for a nicer night. It was gorgeous out. Um, and it was like a block party there. Um, Barber shop had a paint and sip night, and they had about 25 people in there painting. It was really pretty cool if you got a chance to come down. So I just look forward to it next year. It'll be the third Friday in September. So put it on in your calendars now. And uh, you can't say that you weren't forewarned because it's public now, the third Friday in September next year. All right. See you then. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor. Uh, just one item tonight, uh, and that is that I attended the Expanding Your Horizon event. Uh, which provides on-hand experiences for young women. Um, that would be students that are eight, uh, grades 6 through the 12th grade. And this is uh, an event. It's an all-day workshop, and it's an on-hands event so that um, they get a chance to uh, learn by doing activities um, to the STEM program. So that's science, technology, engineering, and math. And I went as a chaperone and also representing um, the city of Riverbank. And it was uh, probably, I would say, about 1,500 young people. There were a few males, but mostly uh, young females. But it was a, an awesome all-day event. And that's all I have. Thank you. Um, my comment refers to item 3E, which um, if you take a look in the, in the package, it has a list of, of funding sources that currently are available, which will most likely, some of it is already in jeopardy, others will be in jeopardy as the ACE train comes on in. Uh, one of the items is the CMAC funding, which is the Congested Mitigation Air Quality. Um, that does a lot of work with our ADA, improving our, our uh, streets and roads, especially uh, in this area, as well as some other, other areas that were neglected. Um, and that will be in jeopardy if we don't fight for it. Uh, the ACE is a showcase, um, and I believe they're going to be disappointed in the ridership, at least the initially, but will be the ones that will suffer for it. So whoever is around in 2023 when they start taking CMAC, we have to fight extremely hard to keep that. Um, and the reason why I wasn't at the sip and stroll, you know. All right, with that, we go into closed session. Consists of item 8-1, conference with real property negotiators pursuant to government code section 54956.8, property 062-031-005 through 007. Agency negotiator, Sean Scully, city manager, property nego negotiator, Ametis. Item 8.2, conference with labor negotiator, pursuant to government code 54957.6, agency representative, Sean Scully, city manager, employee organizations, mid-management bargaining unit. And item f um, 8.3, conference with legal, legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation pursuant to subdivision Bravo of government code 54956.9, two potential cases. At this time, the members from the public may comment um, on any of these agendized items. Um, is there anyone from the public wishing to comment? Seeing none, we adjourn to closed session.
The regular city council and LRA board um, regular meeting reconvenes. Item 9.1, report from closed session on item 8.1, conference with real property negotiators. Direction has been provided to staff. Item 9.2, report from closed session on item 8.2, conference with labor negotiator, mid-management bargaining unit. Direction has been provided to staff. And then item 9.3, report from closed session on item 8.3, conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation to potential cases. Uh, direction has been provided to staff. Next city council rate, uh, meeting will be on Tuesday, October 9th, 6 p.m. We are now adjourned. <laughs>